update on the hackathons. So the July hackathon has been finalized. That will be July 26th and 27th. It'll be in San Francisco. The registration link is now live. So if you plan on attending that, please register as soon as possible. For the upcoming hackathons, we have two doodle polls out right now. August, we're trying to hone in on a couple dates for a virtual hackathon. And then during the September and October timeframe, uh, we're going to host a European hackathon. So please indicate your availability if that's something that you plan on attending. Any questions on the upcoming hackathons? Just one quick. So to clarify, because there was a poll about whether it was going to be South Bay or San Francisco. So it has been decided to be in San Francisco, right? Correct. Uh, yeah, the the overwhelming majority seem to prefer the San Francisco location. That, that's fine, but I just wanted to make sure that what I understood was correct. Perfect. Can I ask a question regarding uh, how the hackathon is going to be organized, the setup itself? Is that being worked on? Uh, typically, and, and others feel free to chime in as well, typically what we do is largely run it in unconference format. Uh, there'll be one main room um, with clusters of tables, power strips, etc. Um, typically it gets kicked off with about 30 minute to an hour overview with general objectives, directions, or some different topics that people may want to dive into. And then uh, a variety of groups then meet around specific topics or specific things that they want to work on over the next um, day and a half during that time. We'll also have a breakout room if people want to dive into more presentation style stuff. Um, and as it gets closer, we will uh, firm up an agenda and different topics that people would like to get slotted in. All right, thanks. All right. Any other questions before we move on? All right. Um, the next thing is the TSC meeting next week. Um, we've already heard from a few people that they're going to be out of office. It sounds like people will be going away, at least in the U.S., preparing for the 4th of July holiday. Uh, I know Chris is going to be out. I know Brian will be away in China. Um, and wanted to gauge from the rest on this group uh, if it makes sense to keep the TSC call next week, in which case we'll need to... Uh, find one of the other TSC members to run the call, uh, collect the agenda, etc. cetera. Um, otherwise, uh, potentially skip next week uh, and just back up uh, after the holiday. Uh, Richard here, it, it, it suits me if we if we skip next week as well. Uh, or alternatively, if it goes ahead, I won't be able to be on it, put it that way. All right. I see in the chat window another another vote for cancel. Um, other thoughts from the group? Does anyone feel strongly about keeping the call in the calendar next week? All right. Um, so let, let's put it this way: any objections to canceling next week? All right. Hearing no objections and seeing quite a few uh, cancel notifications in the chat window, uh, we'll go ahead and cancel next week's call and. Uh, pick up on, I believe, July 7th. All right, and then at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Arno. Arno, I'll make you presenter in just a second here uh, to walk through the exit criteria discussion. All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. So, yeah, so following up uh, on last week's call and discussion, I uh, took another pass at the document. Um, the there were two main driving forces, if you will, uh, to b behind the changes that I've made. Um, the first one is, you know, I looked closely at the uh, set of criteria that were defined by the um, Apache Software Foundation, which has the same kind of concept of project life cycle with an incubation stage they start from and then they match, they they, they graduate from incubation. So I looked at this and tried to see, you know, fill in some of the gaps we had. Tried, I mean, some of these, you know, obviously are very uh, Apache Software Foundation specific and not applicable, but there were several of them that I thought were quite relevant and I tried to adopt for our project. The other thing, you know, the other dimension to the changes, I would say, is that, so we have had this discussion between, you know, are we talking about the project maturation, you know, or mature state, or 
or the product. And uh, we did clarify last week that it's more about the project itself. But, you know, it seemed like a lot of people, we also talked about maybe having some kind of criteria that were more like some kind of goals uh, to be met. And this could be defined as part of the, uh, the proposal from the beginning when people enter incubation, you might want to say, you know, we are trying to achieve these goals. And then these might be more in terms of, you know, applicable to the product that the project wants to produce. And so I try to separate the two. And, you know, I can't claim that I got it necessarily all right, but, uh, the, you know, I try to separate the two in those two lists. With the first one, since, you know, this is more about project life cycle, it's more about whether the project is organized well enough, you know, uh, generally speaking, uh, to, to, to graduate from incubation. Or, or in, you know, so this is more like everybody, it should be applicable to everybody. And so I think we could define this set of minimal criteria that needs to be met. And then there is the other set is more like, you know, the, the applicable maybe to the product. And these are goals that will depend much more, you know, uh, broadly to depending on the project, right? And so there were some items rather than, you know, because I didn't want to throw anything away either. And so that was also part of the motivation. There were things that were not directly applicable to the project lifecycle per se, but I thought it would be a shame to just throw that out. And we did have quite a bit of discussion as to, you know, things like security review and that kind of stuff, scalability, that people feel like these are important uh, criteria that should be looked at. And so I put those into the second list that I call additional requirements with this idea that so the minimum requirements is things that should be applicable to all projects and then the other words is something that is more open ended that can be defined on a per on a per project basis. So I saw that there are several people made some comments and I thank you all for your feedback. Obviously it's seven him my place so I haven't had time to go through everything carefully yet. I will try to do that today and, and, and you know but I would be happy to hear if there are people who want to discuss or if there's any reaction that anybody wants to raise now or discuss. I think that'd be great. There was one comment I made since then. There was, a, I think Chris Ferris pointed out the actual name I had called maturation. Incubation and maturation seems to be, make sense to me. So that's what I wrote, but in fact, the life cycle project uh, the project lifecycle document talks about mature state, so I made that change. So if you looked at this last night or earlier today, uh, you and look at it now, there's been that one change made already to the document, but that's very, pretty really editorial. Hey, this is Brian. I um, I have a few. Uh, I have a few thoughts, um, and I and I um, will and in, in get them into the, uh, the document. But I wanted to air them here first. Um, the first is uh, on the on the second page. You use HIP, um, uh, even though that's I don't think it's defined earlier. Um, uh, and I'm sure you're borrowing from the the BIPs and EIPs from other communities, right? Um, but on these other communities, the um, you know that stands for improvement. Pro, uh, proposal, right? Um, uh, and they tend to be about specific features or specific uh, pull requests, or um, you know, almost more of a standards kind of thing than they do to speak about um, proposals <clears throat> or, or or projects, basically. Um, uh, which I think I think you're intending here is is that it's a code base and a community that goes from being proposed for incubation uh, to being actually in incubation. To being mature, to deprecated, end of life, um, and so I'm wondering if uh, we can come up with a different term and reserve HIP for um, things that are more specifically within each project about technology change. Okay, so let me clarify. The, so the part that I did it is only the first two pages, which ends at acknowledgments. The okay. where I think you're talking about 
is the table that Jeremy um, actually added to the document as a, an attempt to try to show the different dimensions that are you know at stake here. And so this has not been really reviewed by the group. We discussed it a little bit last week. We're trying to figure out how this plays out with the rest. And so do you want to do you want to focus this week on just the first two pages, and then next week on the on the third page? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, okay. we can do that. Uh, then okay, um, then pulling back uh, um, to to just the first two, um, I have a slight sense that the term mature may, um, I understand the value of that in terms of uh, communicating that, um, you know, this is a project that that has actually met a, a number of different criteria and is, is something that we can recommend and it's safe to use. But I also wonder if it can come across as, as a signal that innovation has ended in the project. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know about you, but if I were to be described as mature by a friend of mine, um, uh, I, I would I would interpret it to mean that I was no longer a fun guy to be around. Um, so uh, uh, I'm wondering. I mean, Apache calls them top level projects, which is awkward as well. Um, uh, it kind of almost doesn't matter. Uh, I'm just it, early on is kind of where you get the one chance to to set the right terminology. And so um, I'm just wondering if there's a better word than mature. Yeah, I mean, I uh, released. I don't have a strong. Uh, so if I, I don't have a strong opinion, we we do have I mean we have a pro, project lifecycle document that we reviewed and approved that calls that mature, but it you know if we have a better name we could definitely call it something different and make the change throughout. But right now I'm only referring to terms that are used you know defined elsewhere. Right, right. I, um, okay, well, I, I guess I would just open the floor then to people to consider yeah. um, uh, whether the, whether there's a better term. Yeah. Live is is good, or or um, as I see, hard. So I, I, um, this is Jeremy Severed. I think um, I think the mature term is is problematic, and I think the the term project may also confuse. Um, because uh, the degree to which that mean that means uh, I don't take that word to mean the same thing as the word Brian that you used last week community um, and so I think um, I think the terminology is a, 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 a concern because I don't think um, we want anybody to take uh, anyone to assume that just because of the TSC has spawned uh, an approved subproject that uh, it's necessarily ready for production. And uh, so two I think things that I <coughs> one is that it is. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say you're right. That was my my going to be my second point, which is um, we should get the project or subproject or pro you know, Hyperledger project is comprised of a set of communities and code bases that produce, you know, that sort of thing. Like, um, uh, we should get the taxonomy down um, for that. Uh, I'm willing to uh, be somewhat benevolent dictator -y about that if uh, people would prefer. Um, I, uh, but uh, but it feels like you know the, the just getting a hierarchy naming thing. It almost doesn't really matter as long as we're consistent. And I've been inconsistent. I've been trying to find code base community. Um, happy to take proposals for consistency, and then maybe we uh, approve that in two weeks at our next meeting, um, or uh, or <laughs> happy just to, to declare something and, and move forward. So just so you know, I mean the I, you know I'm, I'm personally completely open to changing terminology. Um, I, I do want to point out that you know the the more we develop documentation, obviously the more the changes will be you know we'll have to to be uh, uh, made throughout the documentation. So, for instance, we also have a proposal template, and um, it's uh, you know it refers to these terms too. It calls it you know a proposal template for a hyperledger improvement project. So, if we want to change the term project, we'll have to make those changes throughout. Is all I'm saying. But I'm not personally. You know, 
fond of the current names either. So it's I think it's kind of things where you know we're kind of stuck with uh, whatever somebody had uh, came up with and nobody had the better idea that could be convincing enough that we changed. But if you want to try, I'm sure you're welcome to do that. Well, why don't we do this? If people want to put together a proposal for that, you know, address this kind of naming and taxonomy question posted to the TSC list, um, you know, um, but I just wanted to move on just because it's probably in some ways the least important thing to talk about with the doc, but in some ways yeah. it's important to get right at the beginning or right enough, you know, and these things are always organic. It's just like language. It evolves over time, um, but uh, uh, it, it, it's fine. It's just pick one and go. So post to TSC and then either we'll talk about it in two weeks or, or I'll just say that's, that one clearly is the winner, and and plus one other people's proposals too. I see. I like the suggestion of stable uh, when it comes to describing and as an alternative to mature. Um, yep, that sounds good to me actually. All right. So, is there any other comments? This is very useful. So, please speak up. Uh, this is Jeremy. I think the um, the splitting out that you've done of of sort of the the base versus the additional requirements is a, a fine one, and I um, and I think there's consent. It's, I assume that there's some consensus around the distinction between the the project life cycle and the product life cycle. So I think so. I think this is fine to move ahead with. I, th I guess my question would be is um, where do we want to put things do we want to put much most of this stuff then in the requirements about sort of the what the scalability requirements are what the security requirements are uh, if so that's fine but so I think, I think the thing that comes out of this next yeah so I think the answer to that is you know if you look like for instance it talks about in the first list we talk about sufficient test coverage and maybe this should be changed to something slightly different but it's mostly it says hey test coverage is important you should you know if you want to to claim that you, you know you should you um, you can graduate from incubation you should have your test coverage um, basically under control it doesn't mean that you have achieved a certain amount, you know, a certain level when it comes to test coverage. And I think for scalability tests, it's the same thing. Uh, I think, and somebody actually added uh, this piece about, you know, additional performance and scale test capability is desirable. So this doesn't say, you know, this is the level of, you know, performance or scalability that you must achieve to graduate, but it says, this is an aspect that needs to be taken care of. So I think this is where the nuance is. In the second list, a specific project might say we want to achieve, you know, a certain level of performance or a certain level of scalability in some dimension, and that might be much more specific in having some kind of number. But uh, so I think this is the difference that that the document is trying to to have or to carry. In a way, it's almost like making sure that the community that is formed here prioritizes and and you know uh, has a demonstrable kind of aptitude for things like test coverage and user documentation, right? Um, it's there's probably separate criteria we can have around release criteria like the the taxonomy I proposed, but <clears throat> you want to make sure before a, a community graduates from the incubator that they at least demonstrate that. You know, those are those are principles that they believe are important um, as they're building this code. Um, you know, that they're able to at least be be able to characterize the performance, be able to have a framework for testing, and care about onboarding new users, new developers into their project. And that's and and that's still that's still a subjective criteria, criteria but um, it's it could be worth having. You know, in called out specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's indeed, that's the spirit of what the, I'm trying to get to there. That makes sense. Well, perhaps the thing that I would imagine we, one could add in that sort of goal as opposed to requirements vein 
would be something around an appreciation for how this stuff might be used. So for example, if you saw in the news, somebody lost $53 million on an Ethereum smart contract that got hacked. Um, and uh, it's similar conversation I had with somebody uh, from a, another one of the open source foundations, you know, in an, on an IoT project, for example, that's control that might be used to control, say, like a generator or something like that. There's a there's just a higher level of uh, uh, robustness and care that may need to be taken simply because of the way it might be used. And so, if 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 with something that has the potential, that I think we all hope that. Hyperledger and DLT has, it might be good just to at least suggest that somebody ought to be thinking about things like that. Without any sort of language that implies um, uh, liability on our part, of course. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but I, I agree with the idea. Yeah, in general, any uh, attestation as to the suitability of software for use uh, is normally avoided, meaning, you know, nobody is going to legally uh, stand behind stuff, uh, even uh, even software that is not open source uh, will not, you know, like Microsoft, you know, Excel, if you, if you, if you buy it, it doesn't mean that you can uh, rely, you know, you can sue Microsoft if you lose money because of bugs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Usually it's the opposite, right? <laughs> you, you want to protect... Yeah, um, I mean, you actually, I mean, there are product liability uh, laws out there, and they do apply to software. Um, and, you know, we disclaim in the Apache license, you know, all of this is use at your own risk, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so far, that's been good enough for the world. Um, so, but this software is now being used in more and more critical environments. And, and the healthcare industry is, is starting to face this with open source software as well, where they can't just point the finger at those crazy open source developers whose code broke. Um, uh, so, uh, um, yeah, anyways, I think I agree with everything people said. I didn't mean to inject paranoia into the conversation. It was uh, more um, just making it an ethic that of, of you know, we're, what we're building um, is aimed at production uh, applications. Um, and when we say something is uh, stable, when we say it's production, recommended for production use, that we have a high bar by what we mean by that. Um, yeah. But so I think there's part of this could also be addressed when we talk about user documentation. Maybe I could add to the, the sentence there, you know, that um, the documentation should provide, you know, some kind of information about what this project is about obviously and what you what you know what the applications people are expected to be able to use it for. Would that kind of hit the yeah. point? I think so. Okay. Yeah, I think the, the, the point is that um, there is somewhere a fine point between exhaustive legalese that covers everything and, uh, you know, basically uh, some kind of a normative uh, approach, which um, tell people to, you know, these are the best practices. And uh, if the, the more of them that you address in your software and in your uh, public uh, release notes and your um, documentation, the more people will will uh, be inclined to use it uh, under the uh, parameters that you specify. Like, for example, if you say it's scalable to 10,000 nodes and this is the performance to be noticed, then somebody who wants to use it in 10,000 nodes would be able to, uh, uh, you know, at least check or trust that uh, that metric that you have published in a user documentation or somewhere else. But the exit criteria document itself should be, uh, uh, you know, quite slim. 
uh, it cannot uh, possibly take care of all uh, future, uh, you know, problems or or cannot be exhaustive in a legal sense. Right. All right, is there anything else? I think we're making progress, so that's good. So I take it that uh, I've heard support for the two lists. I haven't heard anybody object today, so I take it as a sign that we should continue in that direction. Is there anything else? I think, you know, then it's just a matter of keeping on hammering on the different items in each list and fine tuning what it says, and we should be able to get there pretty quickly. The I agree, this is, this is a really great progress on our, uh, our nod. And I think emphasizing at the top that this is intended to apply to projects um, uh, and is separate from the criteria for labeling and, and re making releases of products, you know, of, of code, of actual code, is important. Right. And then when it comes to the taxonomy, we'll wait for Brian to tell us what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a fairly simple change. Obviously, whenever we get a better taxonomy, we can align all the documentation and. That's a, a simple query replace type of thing. So, all right. So, if there isn't any more comments now, I think we can move on with the next agenda item. Thank you. And obviously, you know, the the communication channel remains open. Feel free to comment in the document or the mailing list or contact me via Slack, whatever works for you. Thank you. All right, so. Okay, and with that, um, Todd, I'm just marking I'm moving to the next agenda item. Perfect, yeah, I was gonna pass that over to you, Brian, uh, just to, to give a quick walkthrough of the exit criteria uh, or sorry, the taxonomy that you sent out earlier to the TSC list. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is definitely a, a <laughs> developer preview of the taxonomy <laughs> to be a recursive here. Um, uh, this was an attempt to try to figure out um, just how how we might consistently reflect to um, to new users uh, and between projects the state of maturity of of our code bases. Um, it attempts to set uh, subjective criteria at each level um, with enough finesse uh, to allow some wiggle room, but but enough clear points as well, um, and to describe intent uh, as well. And and really, it suggests that there are four phases um, to a major release cycle. Um, uh, although the the very first one is only used when the project is still really getting off the ground, you know, as kind of both Fabric and Sawtooth Lake are right now, um, uh, but 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 that over time, as you go to a 1.0 or a one dot x or a two dot x or a three dot x release stream, um, you know, alpha, beta, and production would apply. Um, uh, and uh, and so so just a, a quick run through the idea is that alpha was something for which you know were your feature uh, for everything that you've committed to in the production release. Uh, those can be at various stages of you know. Of readiness, but but let's just say there's at least the clear encode attempt to um, implement the features that the community feels are important. It's ready for proof of concept level deployment. Um, that may be an ambitious statement, but I think it's um, what a lot of people are doing today with Fabric, uh, and sounds like may start doing with Sawtooth Lake as well. So I think that that matches. Um, Performance, uh, you know, is at least describable. Um, it's, it's something where it's it's predictable. You're not when you're doing a demo for somebody, you're not going to end up waiting. Uh, surprisingly, you know, two minutes for a garbage collection to happen in the background, um, or at least it's documented if that happens. Um, any APIs that it exposes are documented and start to be solidified because that's that's I think an important thing to communicate to other projects. Really, what what's what's your contract that you're going to form with them? 
Um, uh, there's some first attempts at end user documentation and uh, developer docs are further advanced um, from, from the developer preview. Um, uh, sorry, I skipped kind of reading through developer preview. Um, uh, developer preview is basically everything before that point, right? Um, in both alpha and developer preview, when you make a release, you try to make sure that any, any issue that you could characterize as the highest priority issue, which is different in different bug databases, but you know, generally any, any security flaw, not just theoretical, you know, any, uh, you know, doesn't compile or, or seg fault kind of, kind of bugs. You don't really want to release anything if, if, if those, if that kind of, you know, uh, dangling turret is still there. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and in alpha, you, you know, uh, uh, you, the idea was that you'd have a naming convention that generally would follow like a 0 0.8 or a 1.8 or whatever, and if you wanted to do iterations on that release stream, you do 081, 082, 083, et cetera. Um, beta, further along, is uh, intended to be feature complete, again, just like with alpha. Um, you could also have an opening for additional optional features, you know, to make those um, core features uh, easier to use, that sort of thing. Um, uh, it's ready for um, pilot level engagement. Um, performance could be very well characterized. You know, it's not just this won't fall down at a, at a demo, but it's something where, you know, where, you know, the active orders of magnitude um, required and how things scale of whatever is, is understood. Um, and, uh, and people are actively focusing on asking how can we crank the transactions per second, that sort of thing, um, with some sort of sense of a target for a production release. Um, and here I'd expand from no highest priority or high priority bug left unclosed when you when you do a release um, and and developer documentation should for for that you know to start bringing on the the, the final kind of wave of testers and uh, other developers uh, is mostly complete and end user docs you know are trending towards done and that's where it's a 0 0.9.1 0 0.9.2 that sort of thing um, and then finally production release is intended to be basically an exact copy of the last iteration of the beta cycle um, so that you're not introducing any possibility for regression from things that have been well tested. Um, but you want to give some reasonable length of time, and that could vary a, a week or two, you know, um, longer if you feel like you need it for convergence, but during which no higher, higher priority bugs are discovered, um, docs are complete. And basically where the community, the developers are willing to, you know, put their name on a press release, <laughs> if we do a press release, and, and I, that's about where I would do a press release, um, uh, ready to say it's ready for production level engagement. And again, that's around certain uh, performance uh, uh, characterizations, that sort of thing. Um, and that's where you get to call it 1.0 or 2.0 or potentially 1.0. 0 0.1, 1 1.0.2, 1 1.0.3, or if you're adding um, a minor improvement, then you create a new branch 1.1, 1 1.2. 1 um, I'm not as attached to the naming convention. Uh, I, I know there's uh, you know plenty of other room for opinion on that. The important thing is to be consistent. Uh, and if people feel comfortable putting A's or B's after uh, uh, or DP for developer preview after after release numbers, then that's fine. Um, I, I tend to find that I, it's easier to miss those. And I think Linux did benefit from an alternating approach, which was that the odd numbered point releases, 4.1, 4.3, 4.5, were considered you know, more alpha and more unstable. And then the 4.2, the 4.4, um, 4.6 kernel branches were considered the, okay, this is recommended for production use. Uh, I had intended to get this into a um, wiki document, and uh, if Todd is my hero, he's done that for me. If not, uh, I'll go and try to do that later today, um, uh, so that uh, or or start out as a, as a Google Doc. But uh, eventually, I want to get into the wiki because I think it's having it on the wiki is a good thing. Certainly, eventually. Um, uh, but uh, I would love to take kind of first stab feedback, and then and then iterate it for the next call. Thoughts? Sounds good. Yeah, so so I this is uh, uh, Sean Amundsen. Um, so I've been doing uh, the the release stuff for Sawtooth Lake, and a lot of that's been kind of internal um, at Intel for internal releases. Uh, but 
Yeah, I have, I, have, I have a lot of thoughts about this. Uh, I don't know if uh, we can take up this this meeting's time to kind of delve into um, all of the detail, but a, a couple observation. I think we're combining a couple things here at, at a top level. Um, one, we're combining the, this concept of kind of production ready with um, the major version number, and there might be other reasons to have uh, have that version increment. All right. So if we we start to um, do semantic versioning, where we want to make an API change, but that's not really a statement about um, the production readiness as much as the fact that we are making big changes in the project. Um, this would kind of deter that type of um, uh, versioning change. Um, but uh, so, so that's one observation, just kind of, I guess, status of of how it should be used with, with uh, you know, in conflict with semantic versioning, which is kind of what we've been thinking. Um, also, it seems very um, focused around major releases that we would take, you know, and have six-month releases, and that's, um, and I and I realize that this is more uh, around uh, major releases, um, but I think that maybe we should call that out. That this is around the, the major release um, cycle, and and probably a lot of it is is more around how we branch and think about maintaining our branches. So something like the developer preview, for example, what I, what I've had in mind for Sawtooth so like is at some point um, in in the very near future, starting to do very a very regular cadence of releases. And so. Um, when, when I say that, I mean point releases, essentially. Uh, we call them patch release, releases in here, but they're not really patch releases. They're just releases of the development branch. But instead of having one, there would be maybe one a week, for example. And the, the motivation behind that would be um, one around packaging, starting to get um, you know stuff released into um, PIP and you know uh, Debian and and sent to us, and, and like getting the, getting the software packaged up, and we have to have a regular cadence to do that. Um, but but we're not really necessarily making statements around um, uh, other other than than its its checkpoints, right? Where we're trying to, to release stuff that's not broken, but we're we're not making a big announcement about it. It's really just the development branch, and that that's a lot different than the developer preview. Um, idea here, which seems more focused on uh, on an announcement of a major version, and not the. Are you, are you thinking ongoing mechanics? Just, just just to test this, are you thinking you may want an alpha and beta cycle for say a 1.1 1 .1 or a 1.0.1? Yeah. So for example, so the current version of Sawtooth Lake is 1.1, um, and for for us that we we achieved that when we open sourced it. Um, all the, the versions prior to that were were closed source, and so we put a, a big effort into, you know, this is in March, into uh, preparing the, the for us that re that release. So in in this in this sense of um, that was a developer preview for us. We didn't call it that at the time. We just it was part of our open source process, um, and, and the thinking. Um, Especially after this recent hackathon, where we we got uh, a lot of participation, um, you know, my thought is it seems like we're ready to start doing uh, more release activities. So it's very timely for us, um, and that would be basically on our our master branch, which is currently 1.1, just starting to do point releases, right? Which essentially means we're going to tag it and, and build it for the community. Um, and, and try to get away from, you know, kind of, right now we're we're assuming everybody has developer level skills and is going to kind of do our developer uh, setup activity. And so, you know, those ongoing point releases of the development branch would would be basically saying, um, you know, feedback's valuable regardless of um, whether or not you have the skill to. Uh, actively set up our development environment, 
um, but we'd like feedback even on the development branch if um, the, the level of expertise is a, a Linux sysadmin that can uh, in, install it using uh, AppSkit, for example. So a lot of so so I think um, you know at a high level like thinking uh, about branching differently is is the biggest thing uh, for me here separate from the status of the branch. So and and you know when we if we got to a point where we're we're doing uh, like a production level release we we might bump up that major version number. Uh, for us maybe that's three. Uh, we're at one 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 now. The production one, you know, we might have some other reason to do a, a version two if we change uh, fundamentally something about the software. Um, but we might have a, a version three that is production level, and it seems uh, more logical to me to describe that version number than to encode it uh, in our and uh, in, in how we select that number. And maybe the the shift there is talking about stable versus, you know, if we use the word stable instead of production here to describe this branch, then um, then I think this makes a lot more sense to me because it, it removes, you know, whether or not it's production ready, you know, the intent is that it's stable and people can work with it, which is different than um, the definition of our current branch where we are breaking APIs between repositories and stuff like that. You know, it's often said that if you're not embarrassed by your uh, first release or, you know, the 1.0 release, um, you waited too long to release it, right? Um, so you may have a point there that, you know, requiring everything to be re recommended for production systems when it hits 1.0 may be a, a high bar when, you know, I think I think Bitcoin is still officially in beta uh, as an entire yeah. ecosystem. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. But, uh, or Ethereum is, I forget which, but anyway. Yeah, it opens up production for who, right? Well, I think pr production yep. within some clear criteria, you know, which is on this kind of test rig, this is the kind of TPS you can expect. Um, I, you know, uh, that, I, I don't know, I, I, it's, it's kind of, you know, for one degree, you know, we could be dog fooding it. You know, we could be running our own test instances and, and, and you know, there's been some discussion about public chain, you know, um, uh, if if we wanted to adopt some you know social benefit public chains uh, as partial demo but partial production as well, and and they you know in the same degree that the Apache web server team didn't call something a production release until it was running on Apache.org right because that would be pretty embarrassing if it wasn't um, uh, you know if there was some way of introducing dog fooding here you know to help attest to that uh, confidence in the production quality of what we're building that that would be that be could be helpful. Um, the other thought that we had is, was adopting uh, kind of a even odd uh, numbering approach, um, and, and you know we haven't we haven't done a, a stable branch uh, yet, um, but our, our 1.1 is, is is you know basically our development branch, and so if we wanted to do kind of the stable um, development slash stable model. Of alt alternating releases, um, I, I think that's that's at least where my head's at. Um, given uh, my experience with like uh, GIMP and GTK and, and, and stuff like um, those community projects and, and and how how we did it many years ago, uh, I guess is is um, is the is the model that I'm most accustomed to. But we did the, the rest of this around like alpha beta. That all makes sense, but I think we should be clear that that's for each major version. It's not a one-time thing, right? Like you kind of have that it's a cycle of updating right. to that that stable release. Right. It is. It is repeated for each major release. Was my was my intent, and and I, maybe I could make that clear. Um, so so it sounds like. Uh, 
um, there's two there's two schools of thought here. One is um, uh, different ways of doing release naming. The other is asking whether we wanted to attach these criteria to um, to the to the traditional you know um, 1.0, 1 1.1, 1 1.2 kind of thing, or make them simply attributes of a release. You might say this thing actually isn't production quality until it hits 3.1, as Windows famously was, right? Um, uh, or MS DOS, it's .22 or something, whatever. Um, <clears throat> I, I, uh, but I, I, I feel like that would miss something of an opportunity. Um, well, anyway, it seems like some of the commentary might also be: is there a fresher approach to this? Um, what I would suggest is, if people wanted to propose alternative numbering schemes within this um, definition, uh, uh, that you know that could be done on when we set this up as a as a Google Doc. That could be done as you know extensions below that Google Doc. If others re really wanted to propose a different framework for this document overall, then let me know. And uh, um, you know, maybe, well, maybe what you do we do is provide the space for a completely different write up, and then two weeks from now we try to have more of a um, apple apples to apples comparison between between those two different approaches and. And go for it. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, that makes sense. I think we could also continue uh, and have some discussion on the mailing list too, if that's appropriate. I just, um, throw some ideas back and forth, maybe before before writing up an alternate proposal. Okay, so my action item will be get this on a Google Doc um, and and start integrating other people's comments or or others um, for hopefully more something closer to ratification in two weeks. Should we move on? All right, I think the, yeah, the next item is going to be uh, to talk about the TSC composition moving uh, from the startup phase into steady state six months out. Um, Brian, did you want to kick that off or do you want me to give a quick overview? Yeah, yeah, and uh, happy to do that. And Todd, tell me where I get this wrong. So um, the original charter called for the TSC to be bootstrapped with representatives from the premier members of the organization, which is a reasonable way to bootstrap, but um, over the and, oh, and, it, and it bootstrapped and said that it'll be that way for the first six months, um, and then I, I, from there it'll evolve to be a, a group that is elected by the contributors to the project, and uh, that I, I, and, and kind of leaves it at that. And the intent there is to make sure that. You know, this doesn't be, become seen as a star star council. You know, uh, comprised of you know people who paid to participate, but it instead reflects actually the uh, the meritocracy um, in, inherent in the in the community. Um, uh, and I, that uh, uh, rollover date is uh, August 11th. Uh, if we take uh, February 11th as the first uh, TSC meeting, um, and so uh, on the plate is figuring out. How do we want to conduct a, an election for the next set of uh, the, for the next TSC and for the chair of the TSC, um, and and partly that comes from deciding who counts as a uh, contributor to the project. Um, you know, Chris uh, is putting together a list uh, that he simply pulled from GitHub of um, people whose code has ended up in. Uh, any of the code bases that have been contributed to date, which I think is is very fair. Uh, and he's um, suggested also adding to that names from uh, uh, people who are in the working groups, um, uh, which I think has been another form of contribution that should be recognized. Um, I, I think this community, this call, might want to say, are there other ways of defining who the electorate is? And, and once we define that, um, you know, some some process for choosing among them the you know uh, the the the, ten, the eleven people say who form the members of the TSC and eleven is what we have in the charter um, uh, it's a nice uh, odd number <laughs> um, 
Uh, it does not include me. I have no vote in the TSC. Um, uh, and the TSC is intended to be, to be Hyperledger wide, so um, intended to apply to these projects and, as well as others as they come in. So, um, so anyways, uh, I just wanted to put that on the table. Um, and maybe the first thing for people to be thinking about over the next two weeks is um, what the definition of contributor should be, you know, who, who, uh, and to recognize, you know, the the value of contributing to the project and keeping it very individual focused rather than vendor focused. Um, and then secondly, uh, you know, what is what is a reasonable process that isn't over politicized or ends up looking too much like the American electoral process? Um, and and then finally, you know, uh, who wants to volunteer for for the role? Um, it is. A very critical role, um, and and has been performed admirably by by all of you. Um, uh, and uh, I, you know, I think it won't be shouldn't be too hard to find other volunteers. But I just want to emphasize that uh, it's it's critical to the health of the project that it have this technical leadership, and that's what what this this council represents. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I I personally take it that Chris has been doing a a fantastic job, and and if he wanted uh, to Remain the chair of the TSC. He'd be welcome. Um, uh, and uh, I, you know, but I, but I think he also. I think it also is fair to have that be a position as well that is, is voted upon. So uh, usually that's actually elected by the TSC. Let me check the charter. Um, and I'll do that offline rather than right now. But um, anyways, just wanted to plant the seed, have an initial conversation about this. Um, no, no need to converge on something right now. But if anyone had thoughts they wanted to share on the call, uh, I'd open it up for that. Okay. Well, let's, um, feel free to post the TSC mailing list um, some thoughts. Otherwise, in two weeks, I'll come back with with Chris with a specific proposal then. Um, uh, and feel free to even communicate privately if, you, if there's thoughts you want to share privately on that. Um, so we can we can move on to the next topic. All right, uh, Ben, are you on the call? Hi, this is Sheehan. Um, ben is not able to make the call today, so I'm going to substitute for him. All right. Uh, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to um, discuss the uh, Fabric uh, v0.5 uh, developer preview release. Um, so our main intended goals of this were to uh, stabilize the set of capabilities that we have out there um, so that developers can try it out and then really um, just exercise the release process. Um, I think there's been a ton of good um, info on this call from uh, especially Brian and Sean um, and so you know, I think we'll learn as we go in our, our future releases. Um, so what we've done um, is we created uh, two wiki pages under the Fabric project. Um, there's a release process page and that page um, kind of gives an overview of how we're handling the release process. Um, so we've created a separate branch um, with the same developer preview name. Um, and we'll uh, keep that branch there. We've tagged it. Um, and, and so I, I think ideally we'd move uh, some of this info into a kind of higher level document in Hyperledger if the projects are able to kind of standardize on the way they do this. Um, and, and then keep anything that's you know more specific to the fabric project on this page. Um, one of the uh, other uh, set of instructions on this page kind of describes uh, you know how do we handle um, picking uh, bugs that should go into the developer preview branch? You know how do we select them? How do we vote on them? Um, kind of what's the timeline there? So that's something that um, I again like to kind of see the community uh, discuss and try to standardize on. Um, in terms of what's in the release itself, um, uh, there, the primary new feature there would be the uh, uh, client SDK um, written in uh, Node.js. Uh, so we've tried to standardize that and the, the REST API and the command line interface. 
Um, there are a number of a, uh, known uh, issues uh, listed on that page that we're still looking at, and uh, some of those may be moved into the uh, developer preview branch is needed. Um, so I guess I, I'd encourage people to go look out at those uh, wiki pages. Sorry, I'll, I'll post a uh, links into the chat here um, and uh, give us feedback. And then I, I think we'll participate in the uh, discussion on the mailing list that and started, uh, so we can help uh, standardize the process. So, are there uh, any questions? I think somewhere in, in the release process, there should be some opportunity for um, uh, the uh, for a, for a low threshold consensus to emerge um, amongst the developers. Um, you know, very similar to the um, the improvement kind of proposal for you know three plus ones and no veto. Um, yeah. Something along those lines um, should also be done when cutting um, a release. Uh, uh, and and uh, if at some point in the future, um, I mean Apache does this. The developers sign the releases with their PGP key, um, uh, and uh, you know this community may not be as active PGP users as Apache is, but it's a useful thing to be able to attest to the integrity of the release tarball uh, when it's downloaded, um, and that would be something good to add eventually to, uh, to the standard release process. Yeah, completely agree, especially with the uh, voting threshold. I'd like to see that. Have we established a, a location to kind of put up uh, artifacts like that? Uh, the tar files and, you know, if we had, you know, dev files that we had built that we were, were publishing or RPMs or anything, stuff like that, have we, have we talked about that? Does GitHub provide a good place to do that? So GitHub it provides be, a release or, or tags pages that has that information. Right, but not not to, to easily download the, the release image, right? Um, there, there's a, yeah, it's just like a zip of the, uh, well, it's a zip of the code that you can download. Uh, it's probably, that, that's more geared around like source releases, but um, yes. you know, if we were yeah. going to do builds and stuff or, you know, plus them further by signing them or, or whatever. We need somewhere to, to put that stuff. Um, if that's something you want um, my team to pick up on as a as an infrastructural kind of kind of thing to have a download server of some sort, we can look into that. Are there any the more? Other, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, typically, uh, uh, releases at other projects also have a changes file that kind of describes at a high level, um, release to release what, uh, and I see you have a place for release notes. Um, I guess the release notes is intended to be kind of the tweet, tweet sized kind of updates on each PR that was integrated into a given release. Yeah, I, I think it was kind of difficult because this was the, uh, the first <laughs> attempt at a release, but but yeah, I think um, yeah yeah for the next release, yeah, it'll, it'll give a much more descriptive change of exactly what changed uh, between the two. Yeah. Okay. okay now I see it. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's something that yeah gets updated with each release. Perfect. Um, and I guess that doesn't have to be included in the tarball. That can be kept on the web page. Yeah, I. I don't know, it, and I wouldn't be opposed to including it in the tarball. Also, uh, that made more sense. Um, just so if you downloaded it, you didn't have to go look somewhere else also to see what was in it, and then it would also be signed, I guess, potentially. Uh, are there any other uh, questions about the release? Okay, well, I think that's um, that's all I have. All right, thank you. Uh, so next we'll move into the work group updates, uh, starting with the requirements work group. Oleg, are you on the call? 
Yeah, someone call. Good morning, everyone. Um, in the past two weeks, we've been uh, uh, further developing use cases into requirements. We uh, worked on and discussed um, delivery versus payment by Jeremy Savary. Um, asset depository, um, we had uh, quite a long discussion on uh, identity requirements and data protection. Um, and uh, for the next week, we'll be, uh, we'll be moving into um, a little bit outside of the financial use cases. I'd like to try um, a peer-to-peer -peer insurance use case, see what uh, requirements we can get from uh, that case. That's it for now. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Um, architecture work group. Uh, I know Rom is not able to, to uh, join the call. He sent a few updates by email. Uh, essentially, it was at the architecture work group met last Friday uh, during the virtual hackathon. They'll continue with a re regular cadence uh, on Wednesday next week. The, he said they seem to be converging on a common functional definition of the consensus and smart contract layers, uh, which is going to allow them to have truly pluggable consensus layer that accommodates different consensus algorithms. Uh, from there, he says, uh, as they develop the common definition, both the new fabric consensus proposal and the proof of elapsed time teams are testing bottom up to see if their designs can fit or can be evolved to meet the common framework and they are also looking to have another off cycle meeting next week uh, to see if they can reach a definitive point on the topic uh, any other questions uh, please direct them to rom or to the mailing list or the slack channel and with that uh, on to uh, Dave Vol regarding the white paper work group Hi, uh, yes, so if you um, check out the White Paper Working Group wiki page, you'll see that we have a, a new version of the White Paper draft published. And basically, you know, we've uh, revamped the vision, the background section, why a new fab blockchain fabric, uh, no, sorry, why a new blockchain. We've actually removed the term fabric throughout the White Paper, so you shouldn't see that showing up anywhere. Um, and uh, and so, yes, I'm just encouraging everyone to please take a look. Uh, give us your feedback. The, the, the links are right there uh, for, for um, submitting feedback. And you can also view what has been submitted to date um, on, our, on our wiki page. Uh, you know, we're working on, a, on the glossary. We've got a first version of it, but it just wasn't quite ready for it to make it into, into this draft release um, that we put out yesterday. And we're also in the other area that um, we're expecting some changes in the next version is around the architecture section. We want to make sure that we're reflecting the ongoing learnings from the architecture group, um, you know, be able to give a high level summary of that uh, captured in, into the white paper. That's about it for me. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, any questions for Dave? All right. Uh, onward from there, uh, identity work group is Christopher Allen on the call. All right, uh, we'll get an update by email from him. Uh, and then the last one is the CI work group. Um, Chris Ferris is not on the call, uh, so I suspect that'll come by email as well. There's one thing I wanted to um, just mention that's related to CI, um, which is uh, we have, and I mentioned this on the technical discuss mailing list, I think. Um, <clears throat> we at the Linux Foundation have access to a 1,000 node cluster um, for uh, one of our other projects, the Cloud Native Computing Federation uh, Foundation, and um, we have the ability to um, deploy jobs to it. Uh, we, there's a form to fill out, uh, but uh, it, and and the idea is that it might help us uh, with testing. Um, it could even be something we might wire into some sort of uh, maybe not continuous process, but at least a regular process. Um, is something that you know we become kind of a guinea pig for another project too so i'm cautious at first but what i'd love to do would be to turn performance testing into something that we do for all of our projects and we um you know find some way to standardize or or share best practices when it comes to 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 instrumenting and and building a real science around around doing it so um, what would be great is if there was somebody out there who, for whom performance testing was was a, a thing that they enjoyed doing, <laughs> who was interested in taking on um, the t task of figuring out how to, to to set up with in conjunction with CI or some other process um, uh, a a performance testing um, uh, process uh, and and cross project 
uh, uh, kind of thing. Um, so, so if you're interested in that, kind of write to Chris and I, uh, or or volunteer publicly on the TFC list, um, and uh, and we can start that conversation. Um, not just that. Excellent. Uh, and that brings us to the end of the agenda for today. Uh, so for those on the call, any other topics that you'd like to discuss? Otherwise, we're happy to give uh, 20 minutes back to your days. All right. Uh, sounds like no other topics. Uh, so with that, we will finish a little bit early today and get minutes out uh, later this afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank Todd. you. Thanks, Todd.